The Adventure of a Traveler by Italo Calvino Federico V, who lived in a northern Italian city, was in love with Cinzia Yu, a resident of Rome. Whenever his work permitted, he would take the train to the capital. Accustomed to budgeting his time strictly, at the job and in his pleasures, he always traveled at night. There was one train, the last, that was not crowded, except in the holiday season, and Federico could stretch out and sleep. Federico's days in his own city went by nervously, like the hours of someone between trains who, as he goes about his business, cannot stop thinking of the schedule. But when the evening of his departure finally came and his tasks were done, and he was walking with his suitcase toward the station, then, even in his haste to avoid missing the, his train, he began to feel a sense of inner calm pervade him. It was as if all the bustle around the station, now at its last gasp, given the late hour, were part of a natural movement, and he also belonged to it. Everything seemed to be there to encourage him, to give a spring in the step, like the rubberized pavements of the station, and even the obstacles, the weight, his minutes numbered, at the last ticket window still open, the difficulty of breaking a large bill, the lack of small change at the newsstand, seemed to exist for his pleasure in comforting and overcoming them. Not that he betrayed any sign of this mood. A staid man, he liked being undistinguishable from the many travelers arriving and leaving, all in overcoats like him, a case in hand. And yet he felt as if he were born on the crest of a wave, because he was rushing toward Cinzia. The hand in his overcoat's pocket toyed with a telephone token. Tomorrow morning, as soon as he landed at the Stazione Termini in Rome, he would run, token in hand, to the nearest public telephone, dial the number, and say, Hello, darling, I'm here. And he clutched the token as if it were a most precious object, the only one in the world, the sole tangible proof of what awaited him on his arrival. The trip was expensive and Federico wasn't rich. If he saw a second-class coach with padded seats and empty compartments, Federico would buy a second-class ticket. Or, rather, he always bought a second-class ticket. With the idea that, if he found too many people there, he would move into the first, paying the difference to the conductor. In this operation, he enjoyed the pleasure of economy. Besides, when the cost of first class was paid in two installments, and through necessity, it upset him less. The satisfaction of profiting by his own experience, and a sense of freedom and expansiveness in his actions and in his thoughts. As sometimes happened with men whose lives are more conditioned by others, exterior, poured out, Federico tended constantly to defend his own inner concentration, and actually it took very little, a hotel room, a train compartment all to himself, for him to adjust the world into harmony with his life. The world seemed created specially for him, as if the railroads that swathed the peninsula had been built deliberately to bear him triumphantly towards Cynthia. That evening, again, second class was almost empty. Every sign was favorable. Federico V chose an empty compartment, not over the wheels, but not too far into the couch either, because he knew that as a rule people who board a train in haste tend to reject the first few compartments. The defense of the space necessary to stretch out and travel lying down is made up of tiny psychological devices. Federico knew them and employed them all. For example, he drew the curtains over the door, an act that, performed at this point, might even seem excessive. But it aimed, in fact, at a psychological effect. Seeing those drawn curtains, the traveler who arrives later is almost always overcome by an instinctive scruple and prefers, if he can find it, a compartment with perhaps two or three people in it already, but with the curtains open. Federico strewed his bag, overcoat, newspapers on the seats opposite and beside him. Another elementary move, abuse and apparently futile but actually of use. Not that he wanted to make people believe those places were occupied. Such a subterfuge would have been contrary to his civic conscience and to his sincere nature. He wanted only to create a rapid impression of a cluttered, not very inviting compartment. 
a simple, rapid impression. He sat down and heaved a sigh of relief. He had learned that being in a setting where everything can only be in its place, the same as always, anonymous, without possible surprises, filled him with calm, with self-awareness, freedom of thought. His whole life rushed along in disorder, but now he found the perfect balance between interior stimulus and the impassive neutrality of material things. It lasted an instant. If he was in second, a minute if he was in first. Then he was immediately seized by a pang, the squalor of the compartment, the plush threadbare in places, the suspicion of dust all around, the faded texture of the curtains in the old-style coaches gave him a sensation of sadness, the uneasy prospect of sleeping in his clothes, on a bunk not his, with no possible intimacy between him and what he touched. But he immediately recalled the reason he was traveling, and he felt caught up again in the natural rhythm, as of the sea or the wind, that festive light impulse. He had only to seek it within himself, closing his eyes or clasping the telephone token in his hand, and that sense of squalor was defeated. Only he existed, alone, facing the adventure of his journey. But something was still missing. What? Ah, he heard the bass voice approaching under the marquee. Pillows! He had already stood up, was lowering the window, extending his hand with the two hundred lyre pieces, shouting, I'll take one! It was the pillow man, who, every time, gave the journey its starting signal. He passed by the window a minute before departure, pushing in front of him the wheeled rack with pillows hanging from it. He was a tall old man, thin, with white mustache and large hands, long, thick fingers, hands that inspire trust. He was dressed all in black, military cap, uniform, overcoat, a scarf wound tightly around his neck, a character from the times of King Umberto, perhaps an old colonel, or only a faithful quartermaster sergeant, or a postman, an old rural messenger. With those big hands, when he extended the thin pillow to Federico, holding it with his fingertips, he seemed to be delivering a letter or perhaps to be posting it through the window. The pillow now was in Federico's arms, square, flat, just like an envelope, and, what's more, covered with postmarks. It was the daily letter to Cinzia, also departing this evening, and instead of the page of eager scrawl, there was Federico in person to take the invisible path of the night mail. Through the hand of the old winter messenger, the last incarnation of the rational, disciplined north, before the incursion among the unruly passions of the center south. But still, and above all, it was a pillow, namely, a soft object, though pressed and compact, and white, though covered with postmarks, from the steam laundry. It contained in itself, as a concept is enclosed within an ideographic sign, the idea of the bed, the twisting and turning, the privacy. And Federico was already anticipating with pleasure the island of freshness it would be for him, that night, amid that rough and treacherous plush. And further, that slender rectangle of comforts prefigured later comforts, later intimacy, later sweetnesses, whose enjoyment was the reason he was setting out on his journey. Indeed, the very fact of departing, the hiring of the cushion, was a form of enjoying them, a way of entering the dimension where Cynthia reigned, the circle enclosed by her soft arms. And it was with an amorous, caressing motion that the train began to glide among the columns of the marquees, snaking through the iron-clad fields of the switches, hurling itself into the darkness, and becoming one with the impulse that till then Federico had felt within himself. And as if the release of his tension in the speeding of the train had made him lighter, he began to accompany its race, 
humming the tune of a song that this speed brought to his mind. Fait de mon, mon fait est perdu, perdu toujours. A man entered. Federico fell silent. Is this place free? He sat down. Federico had already made a mental calculation. Strictly speaking, if you want to make your journey lying down, it's best to have someone else in a compartment. One person stretched out on one side and the other on the other. For then nobody dares disturb you. But if, on the other hand, half the compartment remains free, when you least expect it, a family of six boards is train, complete with children, all bound for Syracusa, and you're forced to sit up. Federico was quite aware, then, that the wisest thing to do, on entering an uncrowded train, was to take a seat not in an empty compartment, but in a compartment where there was already one traveler. But he never did this. He preferred to aim at total solitude. And when, through no choice of his, he acquired a traveling companion, he could always console himself with the advantages of the new situation. And so he did now. Are you going to Rome? He asked the newcomer, so that he could then add, Fine, let's drop in curtains, turn off the light, and nobody else will come in. But instead the man answered, No. Genoa. It would be fine for him to get off at Genoa and leave Federico alone again, but for a few hours' journey he wouldn't want to stretch out, would probably remain awake, wouldn't allow the light to be turned off, and other people could come in at the stations along the way. Thus Federico had the disadvantages of traveling in company, with none of the corresponding advantages. But he didn't dwell on this. His forte had always been his ability to dismiss from the area of his thoughts any aspect of reality that upset him or was of no use to him. He erased a man seated in the corner opposite his, reduced him to a shadow, a gray patch. The newspapers that both held open before their faces assisted the reciprocal impermeability. Federico could go on soaring in his amorous flight. Paris toujours. No one could imagine that in that sordid setting of people coming and going, driven by necessity and by forbearance, he was flying to the arms of a woman the like of Cynthia Yu. And to feed this sense of pride, Federico felt impelled to consider his traveling companion, at whom he had not even glanced so far, to compare with the cruelty of the nouveau rich his own fortunate state with the greatness of other existences. The stranger, however, didn't look the least downcast. He was still a young man, sturdy, hefty. His manner was satisfied, active. He was reading a sports magazine and had a large suitcase at his side. He looked, in other words, like the agent for some firm, a commercial traveler. For a moment, Federico V was gripped by the feeling of envy, always inspired in him by people who seemed more practical and vital than he. But it was the impression of a moment, which he immediately dismissed, thinking, he's a man who travels in congregated iron, or paints, whereas I, and he was seized again by the desire to sing, in a release of euphoria, clearing his mind. Je voyage en amour, he warbled in his mind to the earlier rhythm that he felt harmonized with the race of the train, adapting words specially invented to enrage the salesman. If he could have heard them, Je voyage enveloped, underlining as much as he could the lilt and the languor of the tune. Je voyage toujours, vive la été. He was thus becoming more and more worked up. La vie est la été. To such a degree that a smile of complete mental beatitude must have appeared on his lips. At that moment, he realized the salesman was staring at him. He promptly resumed his staid mien and concentrated on reading his paper, denying even to himself that he had been caught a moment before in such a childish mood. Childish? Why? Nothing childish about it. His journey put him in a proprietous condition of spirit, a condition characteristic, in fact, of a mature man, 
of the man who knows the good and the evil of life and is now preparing himself to enjoy, deservedly, the good. Serene, his conscience perfectly at peace, he leafed through the illustrated weeklies, shattered images of a fast, frantic life, in which he sought some of the same things that moved him. Soon he discovered that the magazines didn't interest him in the least, mere scribbles of immediacy of the life that flows on the surface. His impatience was voyaging through loftier heavens. L'hiver et tete. Now it was time to settle down to sleep. He received an unexpected satisfaction. The salesman had fallen asleep sitting up, without changing position, the newspaper on his lap. Federico considered people who were capable of sleeping in a seated position with a sense of estrangement that didn't even manage to be envy. For him, sleeping on the train involved an elaborate procedure, a detailed ritual. But this, too, was precisely the arduous pleasure of his journeys. First, he had to take off his good trousers and put on an old pair so that he wouldn't arrive all rumpled. The operation would take place in the W.C., but before, to have greater freedom of movement, it was best to change his shoes for slippers. From his bag, Federico took out his old trousers in the slipper bag, took off his shoes, put on the slippers, hit the shoes under the seat, went to the W.C. to change his trousers. Je vous jage toujours. He came back, arranged his good trousers on the rack so that they would keep their crease. tra la 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 he placed the pillow at the end of the seats toward the corridor, because it was better to hear the sudden opening of the door above your head than to be struck by it visually as you suddenly opened your eyes. Du voyage, je sais tout. At the other end of the seats, he put a newspaper, because he didn't lie down barefoot, but kept his slippers on. He hung his jackets from a hook over the pillow, and in one pocket he put his change purse and his money clip, which would have pressed against his leg if left in his trouser pocket. But he kept his ticket in the little pocket below his belt. Je sais bien voyager. He replaced his good sweater, so as not to wrinkle it, with an old one. He would change his shirt in the morning. The salesman, waking when Federico came back into the compartment, had followed his maneuvering as if not completely understanding what was going on. Just qui a mon amour. He took off his tie and hung it up, tucked the celluloid stiffeners from his shirt's collar and put them in a pocket of his jacket, along with his money. Arrive avec la train. He took off his suspenders, like all men devoted to an elegance not merely external, he wore suspenders, and his garters. He undid the top button of his trousers so they wouldn't be too tight over the belly. tra la 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 he didn't put the jacket on again over his old pullover, but his overcoat instead, after having taken his cow's keys from the pocket. He left the precious token, though, with the heart-rending fetishism of a child who puts his favorite toy under the pillow. He buttoned up the overcoats completely, turned up the collar. If he was careful, he could sleep in it without leaving a wrinkle. Maintenant voilà! Sleeping on the train meant waking with your hair all disheveled and maybe fighting yourself in the station without even the time to comb it. So he put a beret all the way down on his head. Je suis fret. Alors? He swayed across the compartment in the overcoat, which, worn without a jacket, hung on him like a priestly vestment. He drew the curtains across the door, pulling them until the metallic buttons reached the leather buttonholes. With a gesture toward his companion, he asked permission to turn off the light. The salesman was sleeping. He turned the light off. In the bluish penumbra of the little safety light, he moved just enough to close the curtains at the window, or rather, to draw them almost closed. Here he always left the crack open. In the morning, he liked to have a day of sunshine in his bedroom. One more operation. Wind his watch. There. Now he could go to bed. With one bound, he flung himself horizontally on the seat, on his side. The overcoat smooth, his legs bent, hands in his pockets. <laughs>
token in his hand, his feet still in his slippers, on the newspaper, nose against the pillow, beret over his eyes. Now, with the deliberate relaxation of all his feverish inner activity, a vague anticipation of tomorrow, he would fall asleep. The conductor's curt intrusion, he opened the door with a yank, with confident hand unbuttoned both curtains in a single movement as he raised his other hand to turn on the light, was foreseen. Federico, however, preferred not to wait for it. If the man arrived before he had fallen asleep, fine. If his first sleep had already begun, a habitual and anonymous appearance like the conductor's interrupted it only for a few seconds, just as a sleeper in the country wakes at the cry of a nocturnal bird, but then rolls over as if he hadn't waked at all. Federico had the ticket ready in his pocket and held it out, not getting up, almost not opening his eyes, his hand remaining open until he felt the ticket again between his fingers. He pocketed it, it and would immediately have fallen back to sleep if he hadn't been obliged to perform an operation that nullified all his earlier efforts at immobility, namely, to get up and fasten the curtains again. On this trip he was still awake, and the ticket check lasted a bit longer than usual, because the salesman, caught in his sleep, took a while to get his bearings and find his ticket. He doesn't have prompt reflexes like mine, Federico thought, and took the opportunity to overwhelm him with new variations of his imaginary song. Je voyage l'amour, he crooned. The idea of using the verb voyager transitively gave him the sense of fullness that poetic inspiration, even the slightest, gives, and the satisfaction of having finally found an expression adequate to his spiritual state. Je voyage amour, je voyage liberté, jour et nous je cours, fa le chemin de feu. The compartment was again in darkness. The train devoured its invisible road. Could Federico ask more of life? From such bliss to sleep, the transition is brief. Federico dozed off as if sinking into a pit of feathers. Five or six minutes only. Then he woke. He was hot, all in a sweat. The couches were already heated since it was well into autumn, but he, recalling the cold he had felt on his previous trip, had thought to lie down in his overcoat. He rose, took it off, flung it over himself like a blanket, leaving his shoulders and chest free, but still trying to spread it out so as not to make ugly wrinkles. He turned onto his other side. The sweats had spread over his body a network of itching. He had buttoned his shirt, scratched his chest, scratched one leg. The constriction condition of his body that he now felt invoked thoughts of physical freedom. The sea, nakedness, swimming, running, all this culminated in the embracing of Cynthia, the sum of the good of existence. And there, half asleep, he could no longer distinguish present discomforts from the yearned for good. He had everything at once, he writhed in an uneasiness that presupposed and almost contained every possible well-being. He fell asleep again. The loudspeakers of the station that woke him every so often are not as disagreeable as many people suppose. Waking and knowing at once where you are offers two different possibilities of satisfaction. You can think, if the station is farther along than you imagined, how much I've slept how far I've gone without realizing it. Or, if the station is way behind, good, now I have plenty of time to fall asleep again and continue sleeping without any concern. Now he was in the second of these situations. The salesman was there, now also stretched out asleep, softly snoring. Federico was still warm. He rose, half sleeping, groped for the regulator of the electric heating system, found it on the wall opposite his, just above the head of his traveling companion, extended his hands, balancing on one foot because one of his slippers had come off, and angrily turned the dial to low. 
The salesman had to open his eyes at that moment and see that clawing hand over his head. He gulped, swallowed saliva, then sank back into his haze. Federico flung himself down. The electric regulator let out a hum. A red light came on, as if it were trying to explain, to start a dialogue. Federico impatiently waited for the heat to be dispelled. He rose to lower the window a crack, but since the train was now moving very fast, he felt cold and closed it again. He shifted the regulator toward automatic. His face on the amorous pillow, he lay for a while listening to the buzzes to the regulator like mysterious messages from the ultra-terrestrial worlds. The train was traveling over the earth, surmounted by endless spaces, and in all the universe, he and he alone was a man who was speeding toward Cynthia Yu. The next awakening was at the cry of a coffee vendor in Stazion Principe, Genoa. The salesman had vanished. Carefully, Federico stopped up the gaps in the wall of curtains and listened with apprehension to every footstep approaching along the passage, to every opening of a door. No, nobody came in. But at Genoa Brignole, a hand opened the breach groped, tried to part the curtains, failed. A human form appeared, crouching, and cried in dialects toward the corridor. Come on, it's empty here. A heavy shuffling of boots replied, with scattered voices, and four alpine soldiers entered the darkness of the compartment and almost sat down on top of Federico. As they bent over him, as if over an unknown animal. Oh, who's this here? He pulled himself up abruptly on his arms and confronted them. Aren't there any other compartments? No, all full, they answered. But never mind, we'll sit all over on this side. Stay comfortable. They seemed intimidated, but actually they were simply accustomed to Kurt's manners and paid no attention to anything. Brawling, they flung themselves on the other seat. Are you going far? Federico asked, meeker now, from his pillow. No, they were getting off at one of the first stations. And where are you going? To Rome. Madonna, all the way to Rome. The tone of amazed compassion were transformed in Federico's heart into a heroic, melting pride. And so the journey continued. Could you turn off the light? They turned it off and remained faceless in the dark, noisy, cumbersome, shoulder to shoulder. One raised the curtain at the window and peered out. It was a moonlit night. Lying down, Federico saw only the sky and now and then the row of lights of a little station that dazzled his eyes and cast a rake of shadows on the ceiling. These alpine were rough country boys going home on leave. They never stopped talking loud and hailing one another, and at times in the darkness they punched and slapped one another, except one of them who was sleeping and another who coughed. They spoke in a murky dialect. Federico could grasp words now and then, talk about the barracks, the brothel. For some reason, he felt he didn't hate them. Now he was with them, almost one of them, and he identified with them for the pleasure of then imagining himself tomorrow at the side of Cynthia Yu, feeling the dizzying, sudden shift of fate. But this was not to belittle them, as with the stranger earlier. Now he remained obscurely on their side. Their unaware blessing accompanied him toward Cynthia, and everything that was most remote from her laid the value of having her, the sense of his being the one who had her. Now Federico's arm was numb. He lifted it, shook it. The numbness wouldn't go away, turned into pain. The pain turned into a slow well-being as he flapped his bent arm in the air. The alpine, all four of them, sat there staring at him, mouths agape. What's come over him? 
It's dreaming. Hey, what are you doing? Then, with youthful fickleness, they went back to teasing one another. Federico now tried to revive the circulation in one leg, putting his foot on the floor and stamping hard. Between dozing and clowning, an hour went by, and he didn't feel he was their enemy. Perhaps he was no one's enemy. Perhaps he had become a good man. He didn't hate them even when, a little before their station, they went out, leaving the door and the curtains wide open. He got up, barricaded himself again, savored once more the pleasure of solitude, but with no bitterness toward anyone. Now his legs were cold. He pushed the cuffs of his trousers inside his socks, but he was still cold. He wrapped the folds of his overcoat around his legs. Now his stomach and shoulders were cold. He turned the regulator up almost to high, tucked himself in again, pretending not to notice that the overcoat was getting ugly creases, though he felt them under him. Now he was ready to renounce everything for his immediate comfort. The awareness of being good to his neighbor drove him to be good to himself, and, in this general indulgence, to find once more the road to sleep. From now on, the awakenings were intermittent and mechanical. The entrances and the conductor, with his practiced movement in opening the curtains, were easily distinguishable from the uncertain attempts of the night travelers who had got on at an intermediate station and were bewildered at fighting a series of compartments with the curtains drawn. Equally professional but more brusque and grim was the appearance of the policeman, who abruptly turned on the light in the sleeper's face, examined him, turned it off, and went out in silence, leaving behind him a prison chill. Then a man came in at some station buried in the night. Federico became aware of him when he was already huddled in one corner, and from the damp odor of his coats realized that outside it was raining. When he woke again, the man had vanished, at God knows what other invisible station, and for Federico he had only been a shadow of smelling of rain, with heavy respiration. He was cold. He turned the regulator all the way to high, then stuck his hand under the seats to feel the warmth rise. He felt nothing. He groped there. Everything must have been cut off. He put his overcoat on again, then removed it. He hunted for his good sweater, took off the old one, put on the good one, put the old one on over it, put the overcoat on again, huddled down, and tried to achieve once more the sensation of fullness that earlier had led him to sleep. But he couldn't manage to recall anything, and when he remembered the song he was already sleeping, and that rhythm continued cradling him triumphantly in his sleep. The first morning lights came through the cracks like the cries of hot coffee and newspapers, at a station perhaps still in Tuscany, or at the very beginning of Fatium. It wasn't raining. Beyond the damp windows, the sky was already displayed a southern indifference to autumn, the desire for something hot, and also the automatic reaction of the city man, who begins all his mornings by glancing at the newspapers, acted on Federico's reflexes. And he felt that he should rush to the window and buy coffee or the paper or both. But he succeeded so well in convincing himself that he was still asleep and hadn't heard anything that this persuasion still held when the compartment was invaded by the usual people from Civitavecchia, who take the early morning trains into Rome. And the best part of his sleep, that of the first hours of daylight, had almost no breaks. When he really did wake up, he was dazzled by the lights that came in through the panes, now without curtains. On the seats opposite him, a row of people were lined up, including even the little boy on a fat woman's lap, and a man was seated on Federico's own seat, in the space left free by his bent legs. The men had various faces, but all had something vaguely bureaucratic about them, with the one possible variant of an Air Force officer in a uniform laden with ribbons. It was also obvious that the women were going to call on relatives who worked in some government office. In any case, 
These were people going to Rome to deal with red tape for themselves or for others. And all of them, some looking up from the conservative newspaper to Tempo, observed Federico stretched out there at the level of their knees, shapeless, bundled into that overcoat, without feet, like a seal. As he was detaching himself from the saliva-stained pillow, disheveled, the beret on the back of his head, one cheek marked by the wrinkles in the pillowcase. As he got up, stretched with awkward, seal-like movements, gradually rediscovering the use of his legs, slipping the slippers on the wrong feet, and now unbuttoning and scratching himself between the double sweaters and the rumpled shirt, while running his still sticky eyes over them and smiling. At the window, the broad Roman Campagna spread out. Federico sat there for a moment, his hands on his knees, still smiling. Then, with a gesture, he asked permission to take the newspaper from the knees of the man facing him. He glanced at the headlines, felt as always the sense of finding himself in a remote country, looked olympically at the arches of the aqueducts that sped past outside the window, returned the newspaper, and got up to look for his toilet kit in his suitcase. At the Stazion Termini, the first to jump down from the car, fresh as a daisy, was Federico. He was clasping the token in his hand. In the niche between the columns and the newsstands, the grey telephones were waiting only for him. He put the token in the slot dialed the number, listening with beating heart to the distant ring. Her Cynthia's, hello, still suffused with sleep and soft warmth. And he was already in the tension of their days together, in the desperate battle against the hours. And he realized he would never manage to tell her anything of the significance of that night, which he now sensed was fading, like every perfect night of love, at the cruel explosion of day.